You're listening to How to Stan, the podcast all about both specific fandoms and fandom culture as a whole. For more information about the show and the other show that I do, 17 Karat K-Pop, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. You can also go to 17karatkpop.weebly.com backslash how to stand for more specific information about this podcast. Enjoy the show. If you spend a lot of time on social media, you've probably been wondering, why is Shrek taking over the internet once again? Why is everyone reposting Shrek memes, Shrek fan art, fan fiction? What is going on? And then you may have thought it's probably because of the 20th anniversary of the first Shrek movie, which came out in 2001, but actually it goes back farther than that. The internet has really taken and given new, lasting meaning to Shrek for much longer than you thought. So let's take a look back at the history of Shrek fans and their evolution. The only main consistency from adaptation to adaptation of this story is the fact that it stars a green ogre named Shrek. Pretty much Everything else about the story has changed from version to version. The original story comes from a 1990 children's book called Shrek! Exclamation point. It was a book made by an American cartoonist, William Steig. The Shrek in this original picture book makes Scrooge seem likable. This ogre stole food from the poor. His parents kicked him out. He was just incredibly annoying incredibly gross, farting everywhere. It was definitely full of just gross-out kid humor, mixed with just a very, very unlikable demeanor, terrible lessons about how to treat people. There was no rooting for him in this story. And it ended with him living, quote, horribly ever after, with, quote, the most stunningly ugly princess on the surface of the planet. So it was quite surprising that Steven Spielberg saw potential in this, swept up the movie rights to this picture book, and started envisioning Bill Murray as the voice of Shrek. But then when Shrek entered production in the late 90s, Chris Farley started voicing Shrek, and had almost finished fully recording his lines before he passed away in 1997. The story pivoted in Farley's version from Shrek trying to take control of a town informally to Shrek trying to do it officially, by trying to become a knight. After he passed away, they decided they would re-record all of Shrek's lines in someone else's voice, and on the replacement shortlist were Leo DiCaprio, Nicolas Cage, and Tom Cruise. But the gig eventually went to Mike Myers, Chris Farley's SNL colleague. But he would only do it on two conditions. One, he had to work with a new script. This storyline about Shrek trying to become a knight, it just wasn't working for him. So the story was completely scrapped and redone. With the plot that we now know as Shrek living in this swamp alone where he doesn't want to be bothered, but long story short, he is disrupted, goes on an adventure with this talking donkey sidekick to rescue this princess, and on the way he realizes that she is cursed so that she turns into an ogre every night. One thing leads to another. True love breaks the spell. They get married and she becomes an ogre permanently. The second big change was very, very last minute. Mike realized this voice doesn't work at all and he had this epiphany moment where he thought Shrek needs a Scottish accent. So he re-recorded the entire movie with the Scottish accent that we now know Shrek to have and can't imagine him speaking without. Several sources claimed at the time that this very last minute change cost the company $4 million to do this re-record, but Myers denies that price tag. In any event, doubts were cast over the success of this project, the quality this project could have from the very beginning. There was very low confidence in it. The head of DreamWorks, Jeffrey Katzenberg, said at the time that they were making, quote, a low-budget and experimental movie. They even went so far as to nickname this project the Gulag, because the team working on it was consisting of animators who had been fired from previous projects. So this gathering of rejected creators got together and made a story about an ogre, and people loved it. On May 18th, 2001, 
the movie Shrek premiered at Cannes Film Festival and ended up outgrossing Monsters, Inc. on half the budget. It was also the year the Academy started awarding a Best Animated Feature, and in this new category, Shrek won, again topping Monsters, Inc. Shrek 2 premiered in 2004 and became the highest grossing animated movie in U.S. history at that time. Skepticism surrounding the endurance for these stories prevailed again because critics thought Shrek 2 was great, it was a great peak, an impressive sequel because the second movie is usually worse, but critics tended to see this as actually a high point for Shrek, but then they definitely thought it was all downhill from there. The premise was no longer shocking and interesting and bizarre, the jokes were growing stale, even the pop culture references were just getting outdated. So it didn't seem like there was much material left, but they were going to milk the success for all it was worth, and Shrek the Third came out in 2007 and was largely panned and viewed as just a money grab. But thanks to the internet, people did not stop talking about Shrek. The official Shrek Facebook page launched in 2009, and Shrek himself, quote-unquote Shrek himself, would even reply occasionally to fans and have these cute online interactions with them. So this made fans extra excited, wanted to keep checking in on him, like he was a real person. The page gained 36 million likes throughout the next four years, and the number of likes each post on that page was getting was around 1 to 2,000 more likes than the average promo post was getting on Facebook at that time. The fourth movie, Shrek Forever After, came out in 2010, and that further triggered a surge in internet talk about this franchise. So the 2010 to 2012 range was absolutely huge for the online fandom. In 2010, this comic published by DeviantArt featured Shadow the Hedgehog from Sonic the Hedgehog's universe with Shrek, and it was a fan fiction pairing them as presumably a couple who were making up after a fight. The comic went massively viral, and more bizarre, animated crossovers with Shrek started being published online. In May of 2012, Shrek Chan launched, which was a spin-off of the messaging board 4chan. Then, in November of 2012, the Facebook page officially for Brogers, as fans of this ogre called themselves, was created. Just two days later, a fan had uploaded the official definition of a broger to Urban Dictionary, simply defining it as someone who, quote, is obsessed with Shrek. After a hiatus, the Little Shrek Things Tumblr blog was relaunched in early 2013, and just six months later, 1,400 posts had been added to this blog. This phrase was coined and shared among Shrek fans that same year. Shrek is love, Shrek is life. A Facebook page launched dedicated to the Shrek is love, Shrek is life phrase, and all of the corresponding fan art, messages, movies, etc. I'm going to keep this podcast pretty family-friendly. So, I will not be talking about what that was all about, but let's just say some people took it way too far, as is the nature of things on the internet. But it continued to be part of the new lexicon for these brokers, who basically had this slang dictionary of their own, a whole new language they spoke together online with new phrases and words and meanings to them. The Shrek fan content continued to be taken to new heights, getting more and more absurd in a way that felt like one big joke. Like, all these people online were trolling themselves, basically. Knowing that Shrek may not be worth this level of devotion, but that irony was part of why they wanted to participate. It was like one big joke, one big ironic joke. So they kept making intentionally poor fan art, intentionally bizarre fan fiction like the Shadow the Hedgehog thing, even a fan-made horror video game with Shrek in his swamp as the focus was a thing. So much content. Memes on memes, parody videos, videos that parodied pop culture content like a Shrekking Ball video and a Shrek It Ralph movie. So just like the original animators had taken a bizarre concept, a pretty clear-cut simple premise with some pretty childish jokes and milked it for all it's worth 
into this giant franchise with sequel after sequel well beyond when it needed to stop being a series. That same energy was put into fan projects where they took a premise that is super bizarre yet straightforward, just about this weird ogre dude, and made it a layered joke. Jokes on jokes added to it, with surreality to surreality added to it, with plot twist after plot twist that didn't make sense added to the story. Every time it felt like, okay, we get it, the Shrek jokes are not funny anymore, the concept is not surprising anymore, move on, they did what the animators did and kept it going anyway. No one exemplifies that more than the couple who decided to get married as Shrek and his wife Fiona. This couple actually got married in full Shrek attire. A British couple, Heidi Cockshall and Paul Bellis, in February of 2013, married in these outfits. They did actually save the green face paint and all for after the official ceremony. But then the reception featured them dancing in their makeup. They even had their four-year-old son dress up as the sidekick donkey. One couple who, I kid you not, are actually called Mr. and Mrs. Green, actually made the news for getting married to Shrek and Fiona as well back in 2009. Before the 2010 to 2012 Shrek fan renaissance online, they also wanted their son to dress up as the donkey in the wedding, but he's 18, not four, so he refused. In March 2014, the Shrek is Love, Shrek is Life page got its 500,000th viewer. 2014 was also a big year for fans because of the start of an annual Shrek Fest. Not official, not pulled off by DreamWorks, made by and for fans. This event included costume contests, roaring contests, onion eating contests, viewing of fan-made videos, even music videos, an outdoor screening of the original Shrek movie, and other fun events for fellow Shrek lovers. This event actually still is annual and held today. It's every year in Madison. Reviews for this event on the show's homepage include Insider's Review calling it Bizarre, Sci-Fi's Review calling it Imperfect Harmony, and AV Club's review of it calling it The Death of Irony. 2018 ushered in what became known as the Shrek Filmmaker Movement, where fans decided Instead of just online posts and memes, we're going to take this off the web and in the physical world make signs of our our next level devotion to Shrek, which they did through reenactments and short films. The comedy group from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 3GI, who actually founded Shrekfest, reenacted Shrek from start to finish. A very, very low budget, clearly put on by fans for fans, unpolished reenactment involving over 200 people. At Shrekfest 2019, the comedy group premiered a trailer for the follow-up, which was, you guessed it, a reenactment of Shrek 2. In one of the examples of how this group has been able to make money off of these things, on the official Shrekfest site, you can buy their reenactment on a VHS tape, but they also sell it for free as a digital download. You can buy it for $0 if you want to watch it through YouTube, or you can spend $25 to get a VHS of it. You can also buy both reenactments as a box set for $50. On their official site, you can also buy Shrekfest t-shirts, pins, buttons, posters, etc. As much as the fandom really propelled the conversation and made sure that this story would not become irrelevant in pop culture, there was critical acclaim at first. It just really lost steam after the second movie, but fans wouldn't let it. So ultimately, it was not just the fans, but it mostly was who kept the conversation going. But originally, critics were also enthused about this idea. All five movies combined, when you combine the four Shrek movies with the Puss in Boots spin-off movie, have earned a combined total of 3.5 billion dollars. Shrek is the highest grossing animated movie series and over 700 million dollars ahead of second place, which goes to Ice Age. The Boston Globe described the first movie as, quote, new and fresh and clever. Variety called it, quote, 
an instant animated classic, in IGN gave it a 9 out of 10, calling it, quote, one of those loose and fancy free kind of films that appeals to children of all ages. Interestingly, while the fandom's attempts to keep the legacy of Shrek going strong have really been successful, and the joke just keeps building to no end, the attempts to perpetuate Shrek's popularity just among the public as opposed to this quote-unquote underground fandom movement, the attempts to have these mainstream officially authorized developments in the story have not gone as well. There was a Shrek musical in 2008 that flopped, so much it actually lost money. It cost more to produce than it actually got in revenue. Then there was the side character Puss in Boots, who got his own Netflix show, but that had such little fanfare, such little attention, hardly anyone talked about it. There were rumors about a fifth Shrek movie coming out in 2013, but needless to say that didn't happen. There was an official YouTube miniseries starring Shrek and Donkey called Swamp Talk, but that seems to not have uploaded any new episodes since 2016. The Shrek Chan board has also shut down. It was no longer viewed as cool because of this mainstream, authorized co-opting of this subversive fandom's passion. This sense that ironically, the fans just did not want any more of this official content because they viewed it as taking from them the countercultural force and ethos they had been working with. Once creators had fleshed out this story and this character arc for Shrek and given it to fans saying, here, watch this, it's yours now, fans didn't want to give it back once they felt like they had possession of this and the ability to run with it and make fan creations. They didn't want to go back to a time before this by fans, for fans mentality. So the Shrek Chan board's founder published a goodbye message in 2014 saying, quote, The Shrek meme is dead, and it's time to stop trying to keep this going. It is inevitable, and it has to happen at some point in time. Many of you who truly love the Shrek movies may think that shutting down Shrek Chan is a bad idea, but I hope that you may find another website to discuss the love for Shrek. You could actually summarize the full appeal of Shrek by talking about how it is that the, yeah, sure, okay, I guess we're going along with this and not explaining it attitude, because it is a bizarre mix of fairy tale universes, much like the fan fiction became. They mixed together the gingerbread man, story with puts and boots, the Snow White mirror is a character, the fairy godmother. It's all mixed up in unexpected ways in this one Shrek universe. Yet Shrek also takes elements of our world, the real world, into it too. So it's not just existing in this whole separate universe, but takes from our world. The movies, after all, have a soundtrack composed of songs that are from actual artists, not just fictional ones in the movie world. Living La Vida Loca, Holding Out for a Hero, Funky Town. All these songs on the Shrek soundtracks are not just from Shrek, the real songs outside of Shrek. Then you have pop culture references throughout the series, both subtle and overt. People like myself also have childhood memories tied up in Shrek because, like it or not, a whole generation was introduced to the song Hallelujah thanks to Shrek. It introduced us to, of course, All Star by Smash Mouth, which there's actually, by the way, a whole, there was a whole drama over that in the Smashing Pumpkins, getting into an online spat claiming They had been approached first for the soundtrack. Layers of unpredictable pop culture mashups ensued on screen and off throughout this franchise's history. Anyway, people my age also still quote things like it's like an onion. Onions have layers. So it lives on in our memories and our conversations. At one level, the appeal of Shrek is super straightforward. It's just plain bizarre and funny. At another level, it's a natural progression of internet culture that mixes and further blurs the lines between our conversations that are online and off, our viewing experiences that are online and off, things like that. And, but ultimately, it can all be tied into my third main point, which is that Shrek endures because of the sense of satire back at the creators. To give some examples of what I'm talking about that seem irrelevant, but actually I think do a good job explaining it, Blink-182 made a music video, All the Small Things. 
It was a parody that mocked videos from boy bands like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. But on its own, this parody content became a big hit. Then you had Miley Cyrus with Ashley O. Alter Ego in her episode of Black Mirror. And her Alter Ego released a song that became a hit. Even though the song was overtly from Black Mirror and pretty in your face with its commentary about isn't this all so shallow. The commentary was quite clear in the song, but fans were so excited when it was available for streaming regardless. So examples of this just show that a parody of something, material released as a critique, a response, a rebuttal to other content, can become just as popular as the original thing it was making fun of. So why has the Shrek franchise not been thrown in the dustbin of pop culture history these past 20 years. There are several layers to this. First of all, Shrek was really made for the internet era. It's just a plain funny concept. The jokes practically write themselves. You have this extremely private, introverted, easily irritated ogre living on a swamp by himself with a pestering, super hyperactive, and talkative donkey sidekick trying to save this princess who learns it's okay to be an ogre. That's just funny. Then you got the cat with the boots. I thought only monkeys in cartoons wore the boots. Now a cat does. And just as the internet has warped our perceptions of a distinct reality versus a digital reality, a digital and physical existence and identity, those are merging more than ever. So are there types of humor? Online jokes are getting an offline presence, like at events like Shrekfest, and vice versa, offline events are getting talked about online. And those lines are also blurred when it comes to what is a mockery versus what is actually an homage. What is being talked about online with genuine appreciation versus sarcasm? Authenticity and inauthenticity are not as clear-cut opposites anymore. And in a similar subversion of expectations, what is viewed as mainstream and what is viewed as a countercultural force, those lines are blurred too. Who's the creator versus the fan? When does art become truly just fan-made and fan-owned as opposed to something fans will get behind when the official creators back it? Everything that it's cool to like is also uncool to like now. Falling for the mainstream's tricks. But at the same time, everything that's uncool to like is cool to like because you can be ironic about it and it's all a big joke that you feel like you're in on. This participation in something that makes you think, what am I watching, what's happening, is a uniquely 21st century thing to experience. That sense of surreality, is this for real, being a genuine question. I think subconsciously, part of the instinct when you hate watch something that you think looks dumb, and then you mock it, and you keep talking about it, and you give it your attention. There is this automatic instinct to find a way to make the time you spent watching it worthwhile, and almost defend yourself in a way. When you see something you think looks dumb, it's kind of like you want to say to the creators, what kind of fool do you take me for as a viewer? You call this entertainment for me? This is not the kind of content I wanted. This is awful. What kind of fool do you take me for? So then you play along. You say, all right, well, if you think I'm into this dumb humor, I'll prove it to you. You're right. Super great. Super awesome. And then you sarcastically go on to make fan art and obsess over the content they made. Basically, it's roasting what they did and how they might perceive their audience to take the power back into your own hands as a viewer. Shrek was also destined to be internet fodder because of its layers, just like the onions they reference. Because as much as it's full of super just for kids, not funny when you grow up jokes, it also has some more mature jokes. There are many other movies that have had intriguing and sometimes cringe-inducing histories when it comes to the fan fervor developed around them over time. So we've got to talk about some of those movies and shows as well, and what they all have in common. Why these objectively not very well done shows have such a fervent audience years down the road online. What 
causes their rebirth in today's online discussions. Clone High was a cartoon originally passed on by Fox. It found a home with MTV in 2002. It was this cartoon show made by Chris Lord and Phil Miller, who are behind 21 Jump Street, The Lego Movie, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. They have a very long resume. And they created this show all about a high school where a bunch of historical figures have been cloned, hence the name Clone High. So this scientist is running this big experiment. And so he brought back to life these clones. He made genetic copies of these historical figures who now are all teens who go to high school together. The show is set in the 1980s. And the experiment happening is done by what's called, subtly, the secret board of shadowy figures. The main characters are pretty much the polar opposites of who these people really are. There's young Abe Lincoln, who is super indecisive and lacks a lot of confidence, always trying to strive to be as good as his dad. He's dating Cleopatra, who is a super self-centered person. There's Joan, Joan of Arc, who is a goth character, constantly envious of Cleo and his relationship. The fan favorite character is JFK, a super macho, cocky dude who is perpetually mad at Abe because they're fighting over Cleo's affection. Then there's Gandhi, who's portrayed as a super hyper character, raised by Jewish parents. Joan is being raised, by the way, by someone resembling Ray Charles. Other peers of theirs include Van Gogh, Napoleon, who owns a restaurant, Helen of Troy, Marie Curie, who has a crush on Gandhi, George Washington Carver, whose friend is a genetically modified peanut, that's a whole other story. JFK is friends with Julius Caesar. Cleo is friends with Catherine the Great. The man in charge of the experiment is Dr. Cinnamon J. Scudworth, who is also the principal and for no apparent reason has a rivalry with John Stamos, where every year he has a breakdown thinking about how John Stamos had a better prom night than him. He has a talking robot assistant, Mr. Butler Tron, and he's secretly working against this shadowy board. So the board wants to use these high schoolers in an experiment and train them for military time. But he's working secretly against their wishes because instead, he wants to use them to be brand ambassadors, basically, for what he calls the Cloney Island Amusement Park. So that is a lot to unpack. And a lot of it goes unexplained, and again, that's the humor of it all. People really liked the show because every premise was bonkers, and put it all together, and it is layered jokes. Think about shows like American Dad with the talking fish, Family Guy with the talking baby and dog, Bojack Horseman is another example where we just don't acknowledge the fact that aliens or animals are talking. Whether the Clone High online fandom intended to or not, they grew from the Shrek formula, where you combine things that are common knowledge, whether it's songs people have heard before, pop culture references people know, historical figures who ring a bell, and you put them in absurd situations, or just totally the opposite situation that you would expect, you subvert expectations of the familiar. Add some surreal elements like talking animals, magic, fairy tales, etc., and distort the story that people thought they remembered. Then you add layers of humor, adult scenarios, and goofy slapstick humor. Then maybe add even more ridiculousness on top, like having these historical figures be raised by foster parents who are not at all who you expected. And then you top it all off with some nostalgic elements. With Shrek, it was triggering memories of learning a new song, or referencing the onion line, or other jokes from it. What also provokes those feelings of those were the days comes in Clone High in the form of the animation, which looks very old, flat, blocky, plus the fashion of the characters is very early aughts, and so it provokes nostalgia in that way. And then there's this sense of rooting for what is viewed as an underdog project, a project that a lot of people cannot get behind, makes the people who can get behind it more passionate in their defense of it. Not to say, however, that this formula is guaranteed to please everyone. Actually, the portrayal of Gandhi was deemed so offensive that 
there was a hunger strike in New Delhi over the character. About 150 protesters came together on the 55th anniversary of Gandhi's assassination, and they protested outside of Viacom India's headquarters. Viacom owns MTV, and actually the head of MTV happened to be there that day. And he basically could not get out of the building until he promised to get the show off the air. So the show got cancelled one year later in 2003. After just 13 episodes, it ended on quite the cliffhanger, which further excited fans to hear talk of a revival. Clone High suddenly has a visible fan base online since the news broke in July of last year that a reboot was on the way from the original creators, who have actually said, quote, Our entire career has just been about getting Clone High back on the air, unquote. Clone High has been given so much new life thanks to TikTok trends and YouTube trends, taking pieces out of context and applying them to any situation. Like the joke, nothing bad ever happens to the Kennedys, which happens during the show, right before something bad happens to the Kennedys. Or, my life be so fine, then boom. Those quotes are just very TikTok video ready. There is similarly tons of Shrek parodies on YouTube beyond just what we talked about. Just versions of the Shrek movie that have been warped to add different voiceovers or to speed up the clip in different sections. If you just type Shrek movie but, you'll see a million responses. Shrek movie but, it gets faster every five seconds. Shrek movie but, we changed his voice to this or that. Shrek movie but, it's in slow motion every time he smiles. And similarly, absolutely nonsense videos have spread all over YouTube for things like the B-movie. When a premise is just beyond ridiculous, it tried to mix this weird B-to-human romance plot where the husband gets jealous that she seems to like the bee more than him, with a courtroom drama story where the bees are suing literally just all of humanity for the exploitation for their honey. It is so just bizarre and messy. But those messy storylines make for the best parodies. Whatever the cartoon is that you are seeing get new life again and again on YouTube, TikTok, etc., it comes down to four main reasons. One, these premises are just funny to work with on their face. It's just goofy, too good to pass up an opportunity, the jokes write themselves. Two, the familiarity with pop culture references. Three, the ironic, sarcastic humor of it all, kind of thumbing your nose at and mocking what is considered something you should love. Maybe it's just that look. We loved this stuff unironically as little kids, and so you can either be horrified and embarrassed at your pop culture interests when you were younger, or you can embrace them and laugh it off. This mix of nonsense and deeper meaning about how TV show and movie legacies are, what the fans make of them, are going to be explored on an upcoming episode of How to Stand about the nautical nonsense of Spongebob. So we will pick up this discussion and I'll elaborate more on these concepts I've introduced today on that episode and more episodes on the way. That's all I will say for now. Hope this gave you some insight into how the internet is warping fandom activities and perceptions of the things we are a fan of and raises questions about how at the end of the day, do you truly love something? Are you truly a fan of it? Or are you just mocking it? At some point, the question becomes, well, the product is the same at the end of the day. So what does it matter? Which is just a really layered realization to sit with. So keep that in mind for our future discussions on the show. Thanks all for listening, and I will talk to you all again very soon.